comes out of the letter to the Romans, chapter 5, verses 12 through 17. So hear now the word of God. So in the same way that sin entered the world through one person, and death came through sin, so death spread to all human beings, with the result that all sinned. Although sin was in the world since there was no law, it was taken into account until the law came. But death ruled from Adam until Moses, even over those who didn't sin in the same way Adam did. Adam was a type of one who was coming. But the free gift of Christ isn't like Adam's failure. If many people died through what one person did wrong, God's grace is multiplied even more for many people with the gift of the one person, Jesus Christ, that comes through grace. The gift isn't like the consequence of one person's sin. The judgment that came from one person's sin led to punishment. But the free gift that came out of many failures led to the verdict of acquittal. If death ruled because of one person's failure, those who receive the multiplied grace and the gift of righteousness will even more certainly rule in life through the one person, Jesus Christ. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Let us pray. Open our ears, O Lord, to hear your word and know your voice. Speak to our hearts and strengthen our wills that we may serve you today, now, and always. Amen. When someone is baptized, they themselves or their parents on their behalf are asked a series of questions. When a youth goes through confirmation and they are ready to join the church, they are re-asked this question so they can answer themselves. We call it the renunciation of sin and the profession of faith. And so if you would look at a hymnal in front of you and turn to page 33, you can see all the questions that are asked. Uh, The book of worship explains these questions this way. Since the earliest times, the vows of Christian baptism have consisted first of the renunciation of all that is evil, and then the profession of faith and loyalty to Christ. Parents and other sponsors reaffirm these vows for themselves while taking the responsibility of sponsorship. Candidates for confirmation profess for themselves the solemn vow that were made at baptism. So there on page 33 in your hymnal, or you can see that on the screen now, is the first question that we ask. The question is, on behalf of the whole church, I ask you, do you renounce the spiritual forces of wickedness, reject the evil powers of this world, and repent of your sins? And then the candidates, I would prompt them and say, and if so, we say, I will. And the parents or the people would say, I will. The pastor asked candidates for baptism and confirmation, do you reject the evil powers of this world? We hear that. And maybe you remember saying that yourself at confirmation, or at least when baptisms are happening here or confirmation are happening here. That leads to the question that we are facing today. Where does evil come from and can we overcome it? So let's tackle the first part of that question. Where does evil come from? We turn for that answer to the ancient story of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Paul did a wonderful job reading this story, and maybe many of you are already familiar with it, but if you're not, let me rehash it one more time. Adam and Eve are in the Garden of Eden. They're enjoying all the fruits of the garden. They are hanging around the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and a snake comes to visit them and strikes up a conversation with Eve. The snake asks her a tricky question and says, did God really say that you shouldn't eat from any tree in the garden? And Eve answers, we may eat the fruit from the garden's trees, but not the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden. God said, don't eat from it and don't touch it or you will die. Snake then says, you won't die. God knows that on that day you eat from it, you will see clearly and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. It goes on and it says that Eve looked at the delicious food on the tree and that the tree would provide wisdom. And so she took the fruit and ate it and also gave it to Adam who's standing right next to her. It's not just Eve, it is also Adam. Both are right there and both are just as guilty. In verse 7 it says, Then they both saw clearly 
and knew that they were naked. This moment is what we refer to as original sin. It is in this moment that sin and death, evil, comes about. That those who believe that God created evil, kind of a dualism like, you know, Star Wars with the light side and the dark side of the force, that God created both good and evil. But I don't subscribe to that idea whatsoever. I believe God is good. And the basic nature of all creation, including ourselves, that is God's creation, we are good. We see that in the first story of creation in Genesis 1, where God creates everything and at the end of every single day says, this is good. Now, being United Methodists, we believe in a theology called free will. Just like Adam and Eve, we have a choice to follow God or not to. And because sin has entered the world, we choose to disobey every so often. And that leads to evil being done. Evil started with Adam and Eve when they decided to be like God. Remember what the scripture says. It says, the snake said to them, you won't die. God knows that day you will eat from it. You will see clearly, you will be like God, knowing good and evil. The original sin was an attempt to be like God. And that is where evil comes from. I mean, think about the evil of our world and of our past. Systems of government that treat people as less than human, like apartheid in South Africa, or the Holocaust in Europe, or the way we treated Native Americans or slaves in our own country. Then you have more recent acts like a shooting at a 4th of July parade or inside elementary schools, or acts of terror that happen on buses and subways, malls and planes. These people want to act like God and hold people's lives and their humanity in their hands. There's even more acts of evil that we pass by every day and may not even recognize. Payday lenders take advantage of the poor and trap them in a cycle that they can't escape. Companies force their workers to work in unattainable conditions and for wages that keep them just above the poverty line, but gives them enough money to play in space. Touch your phone for a second. I know you have it next to you. It's perfectly fine. Just, you don't have to pull it out. Just kind of touch it, remind it you that it's there. There's a good chance that that specific phone was built by people and in conditions that if you truly knew what that was about, it would make you cry. These are people who want to act like God because they hold profits and the low cost of goods over people's lives. A podcast called Rethink Church, which came from the United Methodist Church, it, one of their episodes opened up when talking about evil like this. It says, the very nature of evil is when we presume our own selves to have more value than anyone else's. It is the force that convinces us that we are more important than our neighbor, more important than God. It is this force which compels us to believe that our own desires trump love, peace, and justice. It is this force that tells us our value is negotiable, and it is up to us alone to protect and defend that value. It is evil that nudges the insecure. Your only security will come from dominance. It is evil that nags the weak. The best thing you can do is threaten another. When you look at the evil of our world, it happens when we decide to play God instead of trusting God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Evil is done when our needs, our desires, our wants are put above others. We play God when we think we know best for the world over and above what God tells us is the best for God's creation. God had given Adam and Eve a whole garden and said, eat from any of it, but that wasn't good enough. Because we have free will, we continue to choose to play God in moments of our life instead of letting God be God, and we simply be followers and disciples. John Wesley believed that evil is a consequence of original sin. In one of his works, he says, know your disease, know your cure." You were born in sin, therefore you must be born again, born of God. So this brings up the answer to the second part of the question. Can we overcome evil? And the answer is yes. Yes, we definitely can. From Genesis 4 on, we learn of God's plan just to do that. We can see how God attempts to over and over again teach humanity how to live right and how to be the initial version of, that God has created us to be. 
Over and over again, we, as in humans and humanity, decide that we know better and that we would choose to do things our way. And so we fall away from God once again. Then God decides to take things in his own hands. As it says in Romans 5, 17, just as the one human being's sin came into the world, then death came through sin. So death has come to everyone since everyone has sinned. Paul is echoing this notion that we are living in a sin-soaked world where evil will be chosen more often than not. But John Wesley says, know your cure. We can be saved from sin, from doing evil, if we are born again and if we are born from God. Our cure is found in God, in his son, Jesus Christ, who showed us what life can be like if we live for God and not ourselves. If we decide to stop attempting to be God and let God be God of our lives, then life would look more like God desires. This is how we overcome evil. Paul writes in verse 15, But the free gift of Christ isn't like Adam's failure. If many people die through through what one person did wrong, God's grace is multiplied even more for many people with the gift of the one person, Jesus Christ, that comes through grace. When we live like God desires, when we are born of God and give our life to being a disciple of Jesus Christ, then God's grace is multiplied. It spreads further than you can ever acknowledge. One of the definitions of evil that I found during my preparation for this sermon is that evil is measured kind of like cold and darkness. We don't have measurements for those. We don't have a measurement for cold, but instead we have a measurement for the absence of heat. We don't have a measurement for darkness. We have a measurement only for the absence of light. We don't have a measurement for evil. We only have a measure for the absence of good. If we truly want to overcome evil, then we need to add more good and grace to the world. To add more good and more grace, we need to live as God commands, to love God and to love our neighbor. We need to multiply that gift that we are given, which tells us that we are forgiven people, that we are redeemed people, that we are reconciled people. We need to share that grace with those outside these walls. When we do that, the world changes. People change. Lives change. Evil disappears. There's a story that came out in 2018 about this person on the screen, Frederick Douglass Haynes III. He's the pastor of Friendship West Baptist Church in Dallas, Texas. He saw over time more and more payday loan stores opening up in his neighborhood. He said that in his community alone, a five-mile radius, there were 20 to 25 payday loan or, and or car title loan stores. These businesses are allowed somehow, some way through loopholes to charge incredible interest rates. Some of the lowest that they would charge is around 300% per year. And others are more along the lines of 900% each year. These interest rates would trap people in perpetual payments. And they would end up losing their cars, losing their jobs then, and losing even their homes. And so inspired by the Nobel Prize winning work of Muhammad Yunus, who helped millions of people in Bangladesh through microloans, Friendship West Baptist Church started the Faith Cooperative Federal Credit Union. This credit union offers checking and savings accounts, as well as auto and mortgage and even personal loans. They even offer small dollar loans, which are designed to replace the loans that people would get from those payday uh, lenders. Their interest rates are incredibly better than those payday lenders, too. Their loan rates are more like 15 and 19%. Who would take that over 900% any day? But to quote the article, this is what Haynes said. He said, we have given out over $50,000 in small dollar loans, and the rate of customers who pay back those loans in full is 95%. We're demonstrating that people just need a chance without being exploited. And if they're given a chance, they'll be responsible. We've had persons caught in the debt trap set free because they have access to this alternative. 
then they open up accounts and get on a path towards not only financial freedom, but also financial empowerment. The energy our church has invested in the credit union has been a blessing, and the credit union has been a blessing because so many people have benefited. Do you think their neighborhood in Dallas, Texas, their community, even the city themselves can feel the presence of more good and grace among it? I would say they probably do. They stood up to the evil of greed and oppression by coming up with other options. And the church has been doing this since the church has existed, and we need to continue to do that work. One of the main hospitals down in uh, downtown Charlotte is known as Presbyterian Hospital, even after Novant bought them out, we still call them Presbyterian. In Winston-Salem, one of the biggest hospitals is known as what? Baptist. There's other hospitals in other cities are known as the Catholic Hospital and even Methodist Hospitals. These hospitals were started by denominations or churches or groups of people who took what Jesus said seriously to take care of the sick. These communities were changed because of those programs, because of those hospitals being started, and many people were healed because of it. That is multiplying a lot of good and a lot of grace into the world. I thought about one of our newest adventures into missions, our global impact that we are making through Zoe Empowers too. Our church is a half-group sponsor to all of these children. These are 25 households who are run by children because their parents have died or or cannot be in the household anymore. These children live in abject poverty. But because of money that we're able to send them through our budget and through our missions fund, they will learn how to farm, how to take care of animals, how to start their own business, and pull their family out of poverty. Children will learn this. They will learn this from people in their own community. And we being a half a world away, are invited to go visit them and see their accomplishments. So if you missed the email that came out this week, we're looking for people who are interested to go next summer to visit these 96 children in Kenya. So if you're interested, please let me know. We're gathering in August for an interest meeting. But we can be firsthand witnesses to good and grace multiplying from our call to live as Christ. Where does evil come from? It comes from the notion that we are God and that we know better than God. How do we overcome it? We acknowledge the gift of grace offered by God through his son, Jesus Christ, and we are born again, born of God. And then we multiply that grace by living like Christ in our world. We add more good and grace into the world in order to overpower the evil that exists. To do so not only changes lives, but it changes communities. And if all Christians would and could come together to live this way every single day, the entire world will be changed. And all God's people said, amen. Let us pray. We thank you for the example of your son, Jesus Christ, who showed us what it is like to be a true follower of you how to live out the commands to love you and love our neighbor. May we live a life dedicated to you. May we truly be your disciples. And then may the work that we do not only here and in our region and around the world, may that multiply the grace that we receive when we become a follower of you. And we be born of your son, reconciled, forgiven, and empowered to go out to change the world. For it is in your name we pray. Amen.